Hi students, it's Shayna, your teacher from EspressoEnglish.net and welcome to our live class, Saturday Q&A all about grammar. Let me just check a couple of things to make sure our live stream is working. If you're watching this on YouTube, then please come over to EspressoEnglish.net slash live because the chat will be there. So like I said, the theme of this uh, live class is grammar. So please ask me your grammar questions in the chat. If I don't answer the question today, I will save it for a future lesson because so many of my best lessons come from questions from students like you. If you have a question, probably other students also have a question. So don't be shy, ask your questions, and today I'm going to answer a few of them that I received beforehand. Okay, let me see here. In the chat, it looks like we have about 12 people. That's great. Uh, don't be shy, introduce yourself. Say who you are and where you're from. And then we will get started. Okay, let me check everything. And just see if everything is working. All right, let's begin with our grammar Q&A, our questions and answers. All right, so the, the first question I got was about the present perfect continuous tense. I know that verb tenses in English can be really challenging. It seems like there are a lot of different tenses and how do you know which one to use and how to form each one? It's, it can be complicated, I know. But I wanna focus on the present perfect continuous for now. The present perfect continuous are, uh, is sentences like, I have been teaching English for eight years. It's that have been teaching, that's the present perfect continuous or has been if the subject is he, she, or it. So my friend has been taking piano lessons for the past um, six months, or uh, my friend has been taking piano lessons since April. The way we form the present perfect continuous is we, uh, we use have or has plus the plus been, and then the ing form. I have been teaching, or she has been taking piano lessons. All right, and when do we use it? Well, we use it for actions that started in the past and continue until the present. So I started teaching English about eight years ago, and I'm still teaching English today. So that's why I say, I have been teaching English for the past eight years. I'd like you to try to form your own sentence using the present perfect continuous. So write it in the chat or leave a comment and uh, try to write something. Uh, I have been, oh, it looks like the chat is not turned on. Huh? Hang on just a second. Let me make sure. Um, one moment, be patient with me. I was wondering why you were all so quiet uh, and I realized that I have the chat turned off. So let me turn that chat on. Okay, the chat is now turned on. Sorry about that. Uh, so now if you're watching me on EspressoEnglish.net slash live, you can actually chat with me. Uh, hello, hello, I already see some people using the chat, that's great. Okay, so I asked you to try to write your own sentence in the present perfect continuous. What's something that you have been doing for some time, you start in the past and you continue uh, to, the, to the present? So my example was, I have been teaching English for eight years. After the present perfect continuous, you can use for or since. I can say, I have been teaching English for eight years. Use for plus a period of time. Or I can say, I have been teaching English since 2009. So use since plus a single point in time. 
okay? Actually, you can even use since, uh, you can say things like, I have been playing soccer since I was a child, okay? That's not really a specific point in time, but it's, um, it is kind of a point in time, as opposed to a time period. I have been playing soccer for 20 years. Uh, okay, one of our viewers wrote, I have been learning English for six years. Great, good example. Um, let's see some more examples. I have been. I have been studying English and training martial arts since a long time ago. Okay, so in that case, we would actually probably say for a long time. I suppose you could say since a long time ago, but I don't, I probably wouldn't say it that way. So I would just say, I have been studying English and training martial arts for a long time. A long time is, is more like a time period. Good job. Um, all right, don't be shy. Send me, your, uh, send me your examples in the chat. Let me try to think of a few more for myself. Um, I have been uh, living here in my current house for only about four months. Uh, I moved fairly recently. Uh, let's see. Uh, my husband has been learning English for about two years. My husband is Brazilian, he's not a native speaker, and he has been learning English for about two years. Uh, my brother has been working at the same company since he graduated from college. So, do you get the idea of the present perfect continuous? Have been or has been plus the ing form, and use it for actions that start in the past and continue to the present. Keep in mind that there are some verbs that we never use in the continuous form in English. So those tend to be verbs of status as opposed to action. So don't say something like, I have been knowing my best friend uh, for 10 years, okay? No is a verb that we don't use in present continuous or past continuous or present perfect continuous. So in that case, you would say, I have known uh, my best friend for the past 10 years. Let's see, another, another verb like that. Um, uh, believe is another one that we don't use in present continuous or present perfect continuous or anything like that. So uh, you can say, um, I have believed uh, in God since I was a child. Don't say have been believing. We don't say that in English with, uh, with verbs that are not action verbs. Uh, someone else said, I have been waiting the whole week for this live class. All right, well, glad to see you here. My wife has been annoying me for years now. Good example, and that person is anonymous. So we don't, they don't want us to know who, who they are, that their wife, his wife has been annoying him for years. Uh, you might also be wondering, when we use the present perfect continuous, have been plus the ing form, uh, as opposed to the regular present perfect, I have worked, um, I have lived, I have studied. This is a, a really good question. So the, pres the normal present perfect, which is have or has plus the past participle, can be used in two situations. It can be used in this situation of a, an action that started in the past and continues to the present. So I can say, I have lived here for four months. I have taught English for eight years. That's perfectly possible. But we also can use the present perfect, the regular present perfect, for events that happened in the past, just single events, not continuous ones, um, when we don't say exactly when they happened. So um, <clears throat> let me try to think of one. I have visited uh, Germany twice. Uh, I have visited Germany twice. Those events happened in the past. But I don't say exactly when. I don't say, if I want to say exactly when, then I would say, I visited Germany in uh, 2010 and 2012. So if I'm specific about the date, then I would just use the simple past 
But if I don't say when exactly it happened, then I would use the present perfect, I have visited. A lot of students don't know that you can actually use the present perfect in both of these situations. Again, for actions that started in the past and continue to the present, or for actions in the past where when you don't say exactly when they happened. Um, I have had uh, surgery on my tooth. I had surgery to get my wisdom teeth removed. So anytime you, you say something in the past when you don't say exactly when it happened, use the regular present perfect. The present perfect continuous can only be used in one of those two situations, and that is with the actions that started in the past and continue to the present. So, a few more examples from, uh, from you in the chat. I've been listening to your explanation for a few minutes. Great. And that's actually a good example of the fact that with a lot of these verb tenses that have auxiliary verbs, helping verbs, we often use the short form. So instead of saying, I have been listening, many times when, especially when speaking English, English we say, I've been listening. Um, I've been playing basketball since I was 10, another good example. Uh, and then of course for he and she, we would abbreviate has to apostrophe s. He's been playing basketball since he was a child. Um, he, she, he or she's been driving for not too long. Someone asked in the chat about have had and had had. I'm actually gonna save that question for a future lesson because I already have it planned. So keep watching my YouTube videos and you will find out about have had and has had. Great, I'm glad to see a lot of participation. Um, let's keep going. The next question is, do we use the word the before history, future, and nature? Interesting question because it's not uh, just a simple rule here. Let's start with history. Don't use the before history when talking about history in general. So if you're talking about this is the first time this has happened in history, in all of history, then we just say in history. No need for the word the. Uh, but we do use the word the before history if talking about a specific part of history or a specific section of history, like I'm studying the history of the American Civil War. It's a particular period in history or a particular kind of history, the history of the American Civil War, or this player has scored the most points in the history of basketball. It's another example of a specific type of history. So when talking about specific uh, types or areas of history, then we use the, the history. It's usually the history of and then whatever the topic or area is. When talking about just history in general, all of history, then don't use the. How about future? Yes, use the before future. So uh, I'm planning to travel uh, to Brazil in the future. Um, in the future, I hope to get my master's degree. Uh, so it, I'd like you to try it now. Tell me about something that you are planning or hoping to do in the future. Okay, with future, always use the. Let's, let me wait for a couple of examples while I look through the chat. I think there's a little bit of a delay, so I'm going to have to be patient. All right, so a few people are still uh, talking about the previous examples. Since the video started, Shayna has been talking about present perfect continuous. Great, perfect example for that. Let's see some examples for the future, talking about the future. Sometimes, uh, the reason I brought this up is because sometimes I do, when I'm correcting homework for students in my courses, I see students write in future. And maybe in your own language, it's not, uh, the word the is not used before future, but in English, we do use the before future. 
I'm planning on buying a new phone in the near future. Great example. The near future means soon. All right, so we have um, the near future. That means soon in just a little bit of time. It can mean in a couple of days or maybe months. And we have the distant future, which is a much longer time period, maybe years in, in the future. Uh, in the future, I'm planning to get my passport. Okay, so with planning, this actually brings up an interesting point. With planning, you can either say planning to get my passport, or you can say planning on getting my passport. There's no difference in meaning, it's just two ways to say the same thing, okay? So if you're uh, gonna use planning, say planning to, and then the base form, or planning on, and then the ing form. What am I planning on doing? I'm planning on visiting my grandparents for Christmas. Uh, that's something we always do at the end of the year. So I'm planning on visiting or I'm planning to visit uh, my grandparents for Christmas. Someone else said, I want to get a teaching job in the future. I'm going to buy one of your course in the future. That should be one of your courses because I have many courses and uh, I'm going to buy one of the many courses, one of your courses in the future. And great, I hope you'll enjoy uh, the course that you're planning to buy. Let's see, any other examples? Oh yeah, uh, someone else suggested, I mentioned in the near future, which is soon, and in the distant future, which is far, you can also say in the remote future, that also means far in the future, or in the far future, I suppose. So, good examples, keep them coming for future. What about nature? Do we use the before nature? Well, nature has a couple of different meanings. When we use, uh, when we use nature to refer to the natural world, so uh, trees and mountains and rivers, then we don't use the. We just say, um, I love going outside so I can be in nature or um, around nature, you don't need to have you don't need to say the when talking about nature, meaning natural surroundings, um, you know, green trees and all that. Uh, but nature can also mean not just the the natural world, but also nature can mean something like essence. So for example, you might say, I don't understand the nature of the problem. That means um, the type of problem it is or what exactly is involved in this problem. That's what it means to say the nature of the problem. So when talking about nature as the essence of something, uh, then we use the, the nature of the problem. Uh, could you tell me more about the nature of the course, meaning, what is this course like? What's in it? What is the essence of this course? Got it? So two different meanings for nature. One meaning the natural world, our, our world, our earth. Um, and then you don't, need, uh, you don't need the word the before nature in that case. And uh, you can also use nature to mean essence. And in that case, you would use the, usually the nature of the problem. Uh, it's the nature of her personality, means that's the way she is, that's the type of person she is. All right, uh, let me see what's going on in the chat here. Uh, someone, someone asked about uh, using ing for the future. So yes, you can use the present continuous, so that's something like I'm getting or I'm visiting to talk about the future. This is very common. So present continuous can be used to talk about what's going on right now. So right now I'm teaching a live class or you can use it for the future. And we usually uh, say when in the future it is. I'm getting my passport in a few days. Uh, I'm getting my passport in a few days means I am going to get my passport a few days in the future. But a lot of times instead of saying I'm going to get, because that's really long, we'll say, I'm getting my passport in a few days. I'm visiting my grandparents for Christmas. Christmas is in the future from now. Uh, 
That's a very common way to talk about the future in English, actually. You can also say by nature. Someone gave the example, she is mean by nature. Yeah, uh, you, can, you can say she's mean by nature. That means she is naturally mean. That mean means unfriendly. It's the opposite of friendly and considerate. I hope you don't know anyone who's mean by nature, uh, but that's another way to use the word nature, by nature. Okay, someone wrote, we should take care of the nature. Well, in that case, you're talking about the natural world. Don't use the. We should take care of nature. If you say environment, environment is another way to describe the natural world, then yes, we do use the. We should take care of the, or sorry, we should take care of the environment, or we should take care of nature. I hope that's clear. I know that uh, these little tiny rules in English can be a little confusing, but that's why I'm doing this Q&A session. Let's continue to the next topic, which is about the structures have something done and get something done. When do we use these? What's the difference between them? So have something done and get something done, we use for when we give the responsibility for an action to someone else. So let's say my car is broken. I don't know how to fix my car. Um, so I say, I'm going to have my car repaired. That means I'm going to give my car to someone else, probably a mechanic, and that person is going to repair my car. I'm going to have my car repaired. Implied in that statement is by someone else. Okay. It means I'm not going to do it myself. I'm going to give the responsibility to someone else. We can also say get my car repaired. The only difference between have have my car repaired and get my car repaired in this case is that get is just a little more informal, but we use both of them interchangeably in everyday English. You can also use these in the past, like last week I got my hair cut. So I didn't cut my own hair, someone else, the hairstylist cut my hair. Last week I got my hair cut or I had my hair cut. How do we form uh, these thing, these structures? We use have or get plus the thing and then the past participle of the verb. So have my car repaired, uh, have my hair cut. Cut is an irregular verb. It's cut in the present, cut in the past, and cut in the past participle. Remember, a lot of English verbs are irregular. So if you're not sure, a lot of times the past participle is the same as the simple past, as in repair and repaired. Uh, but in a lot of cases, especially with the most common verbs, the past participle is different. So we have, for example, um, eat, ate, and eaten. Someone wrote, I had my heart broken or I got my heart broken. Good example. So that means this person was in a ro romantic relationship and the other person, the partner, broke their heart. So uh, I had my heart broken. Broken is the past participle of break or I got my heart. I got my heart broken. I got my hair dyed light brown the other day. Good example. So this person went to um, a stylist, went to a hair salon and the stylist dyed their hair brown. Remember that for hair, when we change the color of hair, we use the verb die, that's D-Y-E. Uh, pronounced exactly the same as die, like not be alive, but uh, die, D-Y-E, means to color your hair. Sometimes I see students use paint for coloring hair, and we don't use paint in English. In some other languages, yes, but in English, specifically for changing hair color, we use dye, D-Y-E. So I got my hair dyed. I had my watch fixed. Good example. Uh, this person brought their watch to uh, someone to, who knows how to repair watches. He had his watch fixed. Uh, okay, I need to get my hair cut today or in the near future. I had my classmate terminated. 
Mm, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by terminating a classmate. Do you mean that the person was kicked out of the class? Uh, explain it to me in the chat. Can you say, I got my feelings hurt? Yeah, it means someone else uh, hurt your feelings. Good example. Um, let me see. So, I had my sentence read. <laughs> Great, it's, yeah, that means someone posted a sentence and then I read it, I had my sentence read by Shana. Someone else posted an example uh, about have someone else uh, do something. So that's a similar structure, a little bit different. So let's, let's take the example of I had my car repaired. You can also say I had the mechanic repair my car. So it expresses the same idea essentially, but now we're saying specifically who did the action. And in this case, we would use have uh, or had in the past plus the person plus the base form of the verb. I had the mechanic repair my car or I'm going to have my secretary call you. It means uh, I will give the responsibility to my secretary of making this phone call. Uh, let me try to think of another one. I'm going to have... We usually use this structure when, we, when you're in a position of some authority, so you can, you can ask other people to do things for you. Um, when I was a teacher, I had my assistant make copies. So I would give a worksheet to my assistant and then that person would make the copies for me. I had the plumber fix my faucet. Okay, so it's a, the structure is a little different. If you have something done, then we use have plus the thing plus the past participle. Uh, I had my faucet fixed. But if we put the person in the middle, have someone do something, then we use the base form of the verb, not the past participle. I had the plumber fix, not fixed, my faucet. Um, okay, uh, let's see. I had my students sing the song in class. Great, this person is a teacher and they asked their students to sing a song. I had my students sing the song in class. Good examples, everyone. I'm really proud of you for trying to put this grammar into practice. Our next topic, someone asked after, I think I, I corrected his homework uh, in one of my courses, probably Advanced English Grammar, and he asked, can I use there isn't with a singular noun, like there isn't any window in my room? The answer to this, again, is not so clear cut. It's not so black and white. Uh, the answer is no, you can't use this structure if the noun is countable. So window is a countable noun. We can have one window, two windows, three windows, and so on. So in this case, we should use the plural. There aren't any windows in my room. Don't ask me why, it's just the way the English is. There aren't any tools in the box. There aren't any eggs in the fridge. Go ahead and write your own sentence like this. Um, there aren't any clean clothes in the dresser. Uh, let's see. So with, when the noun is countable, and you want to use, uh, you, want, you want to talk about absence. You can say there aren't any and then say it in the plural. You can also say there are no. There are no windows in my room. There are no eggs in the fridge, but it has to be plural. There aren't any eggs or there are no eggs. Now, if the noun is uncountable, meaning we can't make it plural. There are some nouns that we, we can't count in English. Uh, things like bread and rice, uh, butter, information is also like that in English. We, don't, we never make information plural. Then we use there isn't. So uh, there isn't any 
information on the website. It's a really common mistake. Students say informations, but we never say informations in English. There isn't any information, singular, on the website. Or I mentioned bread. There isn't any bread in the kitchen. Furniture is also uncountable in English. So never say furnitures. We say there isn't any furniture uh, in, in the room. Uh, if you want to talk about a couple of furniture pieces, you can say pieces of furniture. For example, I bought five new pieces of furniture, but don't say five furnitures. It's not correct. You can say uh, some furniture or a lot of furniture, but if talking about a number, then you, you need to say pieces, pieces of furniture. It's the same with advice. Never say advices, always uh, pieces of advice or some advice, a little advice, a lot of advice, but never advices. Okay, uh, let's, let's see your examples. So there aren't any plus a countable noun or there isn't any plus an uncountable noun. All right, so there aren't any people in this room. Yeah, I would say it that way. There aren't any people in this room. You could also say, it would actually probably be more common to say, there's no one in this room. So with people, we have a little bit of a more complicated situation because we could also say somebody or anybody or nobody. Uh, and those are all singular, by the way. So you could say, there's nobody or no one in this room, or there's somebody or someone in this room. Uh, let's see, what else? Give me some examples with there isn't and there aren't. I'll wait for you. If you're watching this later in the recording, then I would encourage you, even though we're not doing the live chat anymore, to write down your own examples. Um, you know, uh, just write them down on a piece of paper or pause the video maybe if you, if, you don't want, if you don't want to listen and write at the same time and try to write uh, as many sentences as you can, as many as you can think of. Um, okay, there are five glasses of coffee on the table. Great, glasses is countable. There are five glasses of coffee on the table. Uh, by the way, you might not know this, but uh, here uh, I don't have an example around me, but you know that special cup that we use for coffee? It's It's thicker than a regular cup and it has a handle. We can call that a coffee mug. Mug is a special kind of cup that's usually used for uh, hot beverages uh, like tea and um, hot chocolate mo and mostly coffee. Uh, but that's called a coffee, it can be called a coffee mug. There's no space in the room. Great example, space is, uh, is uncountable in this case. There's no space in the room. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's common to, to make these kind of mistakes and uh, some of it is just getting familiar with the idea of countable and uncountable and then just reinforcing it by practicing it, by hearing it, uh, sometimes by being corrected, and then it will stick in your, uh, in your mind. Okay, let's keep going. And, oh yeah, great, another good example. There are three of us here. Um, so talking about three people, in this case yourself included, there are three of us here. There is something missing. Uh, there is uh, something wrong. Right, something uh, and anything are both considered plural in English. Actually, here's something you might not know. Everything is everything and everybody these words are also considered singular, even though they refer to a lot of things, right? And a lot of people. Everything and everybody and everyone are, uh, sing are singular. Yeah, they take a singular verb. So that's why we say everybody is happy instead of everybody are happy, okay? Everybody is happy. 
everything was perfect at the event. Um, let's see, everyone, uh, let's see, uh, everyone was late to class. So uh, yeah, everything, everything is uh, singular. Everyone is singular. Everybody is singular. Doesn't seem to make sense, but that's just just the way it is in English. There were a lot of confused people in the fair. There aren't any cars in the garage. There is no place like home. That's a great one. Uh, all right, good, good job. Uh, I wanna wrap up with a question that is important for everyone who's studying uh, English. And that is, a few of my students have expressed this to me. They say, okay, I study grammar a lot and I understand it in theory and I can even, you know, I can complete the exercises, but when it comes to speaking, it just, I, I can't think of the grammar in the moment and it all just goes out of my head or it takes too long to think about the grammar when I'm speaking. How can I actually use grammar correctly when speaking English? This is, um, yeah, this is a great, uh, this is a great question. So it's true, when you're speaking, there's really no time to, to think about grammar rules and to kind of analyze, oh, I need to put this in the past participle and then I need to use have and been and there, there's no time. Uh, when you're speaking, when you're in the middle of a conversation, you have to speak, I, I don't wanna say fast, but you have to, you can't you know, wait and do all that thinking before speaking. So you need to use your grammar uh, pretty quickly. But what if, like my students who are struggling with this, what if the grammar, it just doesn't come to mind in that moment? What tends to happen is that uh, students, uh, they either freeze, they pause a lot, and they, uh, they, they have these long pauses in the middle of their sentences as they're kind of really thinking carefully about their grammar, or students lose their confidence and they become afraid to speak at all, and they just prefer not to say anything. I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to be able to speak, uh, speak more easily and comfortably and confidently. So how can you put grammar into practice when you're speaking? Well, the first step is actually exactly what we've been doing in this lesson, and that is to consciously and deliberately practice the grammar. So the mistake a lot of students make is they'll study and study and study and read and read and read and read so many lessons on the present perfect, for example, but they never try to make their own examples. So they might understand the present perfect in theory uh, or recognize the present perfect when they read it, but they haven't practiced producing the present perfect. So exactly what we've been doing in this lesson when I ask you to create your own sentence, that's what you wanna do every time you study grammar. So don't just passively read or passively watch. After you're finished, then actively put that grammar into practice. Try to write, I don't know, 10 sentences using that structure that you've just learned. I did this when I learned my second language, which was Portuguese. Portuguese also has a lot of irregular verbs and they were hard to remember. I mean, you know, English has uh, hundreds of irregular verbs. Portuguese, I don't know if it's the same number, but there's there are a lot of irregular verbs. And so what I would do is I would take each verb and I would write it at, on the top of a page in my notebook. And then I would just write sentences and sentences and sentences um, using that verb in a slightly different way, just over and over so it would get into my head uh, and I would remember the form of this irregular verb. When I went through uh, English teacher training, this was something we would have our students do frequently. We would have something called structured practice before the free speaking practice. So the idea behind structured practice is you just, um, you just do, do that same structure as much as you can. You try to put it into practice. And then later, when you do the free practice, which is spontaneous speaking um, uh, and other activities that are more like real life, 
you will have created a pattern in your mind through the structured practice so that then it just comes naturally. I mean, think about your native language. In your native language, you don't have to think about the grammar rules, you just know them, but it's because of all that practice you had over the years, hearing other people use the structure correctly, uh, using it yourself, maybe getting corrected on it as a, a child. Um, and so you have years and years and years of that exposure and practice in your own native language and that's why you no longer have to think about grammar rules. So in English you need to do the conscious and deliberate practice in order to to get those patterns into your mind and then uh, it will come out naturally in English too. If you're doubting me that it will come out naturally in English, just think about phrases that you already know really well in English. Like you've probably said the phrase, my name is, and then your name, a, a billion times. Okay, maybe not a billion, but a lot. You don't even have to think about whether to use is or are or was or were. You know that the phrase is my name is. Um, and it just comes out naturally because of so many times that you've said it in your English class or in talking with uh, other speakers. So uh, someone wrote practice makes perfect. Yes, that is absolutely the case. Uh, or when someone says thank you in English and you automatically say you're welcome. Again, you don't have to stop and think about what tense the verb is in or whether to use welcome or welcoming or welcomed. You just say you're welcome. It's become automatic because you've practiced it enough. So with time and practice, I promise that even these more complicated structures, countable and uncountable, uh, present perfect continuous, all of these things will become more natural to you as well. I know because I've seen it in my advanced students. I know that when you're, especially when you're intermediate and pre-intermediate, it's a, it's a struggle, it's hard, and it feels like it's never going to get better, but keep going, it does get better. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that, remember, when you're speaking, Spoken English does not perfectly follow grammar rules a lot of the times, especially sentence structure. The sentence structure of spoken English is often quite fluid. We speak in run-on sentences. That means sentences that are too long if we were to write them down in written English or sentence fragments. We start sentences with but and which you're not really supposed to do in more formal written English. So the grammar of spoken English is more flexible than with uh, written English when, you, when you're writing an email or, or an article or a report or something like that. So what, what I think happens is I think a lot of students put a lot of pressure on themselves to make their spoken English perfect grammatically. And it doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. Uh, just the other day, someone pointed out a grammar mistake that I made in one of my videos where I was speaking spontaneously and I, I misspoke something. I don't remember what it was, but it was a grammar mistake. I didn't even realize it until this person pointed it out. And I said, well, that's just an example of how spoken English is often imperfect. It's not perfect. But remember that the goal of spoken English is to communicate. So you can communicate even if it's not perfect to the last detail. So don't put so much pressure on yourself. Don't let that uh, obsession with making your grammar perfect stop you from speaking. You should just speak. Uh, if there's a misunderstanding, then just try to clarify it and try to find out from the other person what the correct phrase is. Um, but don't, don't let it stop you from speaking, all right? I hope these tips have been helpful. I really hope that you keep practicing your grammar, like I mentioned. Uh, and uh, yeah, and it will, it will become more natural with time. Before you know it, uh, you will be using all of the verb tenses naturally and normally without having to think about them. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, so this was a great class. I really enjoyed answering your questions and uh, interacting with you in the chat. But I know that we kind of were all over the place. We went from verb tenses to articles to uh, uh, tips for speaking. If you're looking for a more structured way to study and to learn and to practice grammar, then I have a couple of options for you. One of them 
is uh, I have two grammar books available for one dollar and those are my basic and intermediate grammar books. So it's two books, they go through all of the basic and the intermediate English grammar. I explain everything in the typical style you're used to very clearly with examples. And those two ebooks come with audio. So you can both listen to the, the lessons and read them. I think that's really important. It's great for reviewing the basics. Uh, if you're a basic or intermediate learner, it's, it's important to have those basics uh, solid and established. And even if you're a little more advanced, sometimes it can be good to review to make sure you don't have any bad habits or mistakes. And then if you're ready for something more challenging, I have a course called the Advanced English Grammar Course. And that's 45 lessons. It goes in a lot of detail through all of the verb tenses, more complex uh, structures like conditionals, things like if I had brought my umbrella, I wouldn't have gotten wet. Those sentences that are, oh, they can be challenging. They can be really hard to, to think about how to create those sentences. The course covers uh, prepositions, adjectives, adverbs, um, as well as some other direct and reported questions uh, and other just kind of more complex sentence structures. But the best part about this course, I really think, is the feedback. So every single lesson comes with a writing task where I'll give you a, a topic to write about which uses the grammar from the lesson and then you can send me your writing and I will give you feedback and correct it. Uh, that's really, really valuable to be able to get feedback from a native speaker and a teacher, correct any mistakes, find out if there's anything you're, you're writing that's unnatural and uh, make it more natural. And I've seen a couple of my students here. Someone wrote, I'm truly enjoying the collocations course you created. That's referring to another product of mine, the 1000 Collocations ebook. Uh, I have a lot of courses, but since today's lesson focused on grammar, I wanted to call your attention to the $1 grammar ebooks. It's a good place to start. And then if you're more advanced or if you have finished the ebooks, then go ahead and check out my advanced English grammar course. There are links to both of those under this video or in the description for this video. Uh, and you can continue to, of course, send me, uh, send me questions leave comments on Facebook or on YouTube. Sometimes I'm not able to respond to everyone, uh, but I'm always reading them and I'm always taking your ideas into consideration for future lessons. So thank you for joining me today. I'm really glad I see a few comments saying that you enjoyed uh, my live class, which is great. Uh, you not only deliver knowledge, but confidence too. Both are equally important to be fluent. Yeah, this is true. You know, I can't tell you how many students I see who their English is good. And I'm not just saying that to make them feel good. I'm saying it because I'm a teacher. I know the different levels and I can tell that their English is good. But because of a lack of confidence, they're holding back. They don't try. And uh, it makes me so sad because I know that their English is good enough to use and communicate and um, they're underestimating themselves. So your English is probably better than you think. You're probably comparing yourself to a native speaker and thinking, oh, I, I forgot the word or oh, I don't, I don't know that verb tense or oh, he speaks faster than me. But you really have to don't compare yourself to anyone else. Compare yourself to your own progress. Uh, think about yourself three years ago, the English you had three years ago and the English you have now, and just keep working through, um, keep working through the, uh, your progress and you will build that confidence. Okay, I'm going to finish up this video. The recording will be available on my YouTube channel uh, probably tomorrow and on my Facebook page as well. If you're not following me on YouTube and Facebook, make sure that you uh, like my page on Facebook and follow me on YouTube so that you will get all of the lessons. You'll get notified of them when I publish them. Thank you for spending some time for me with me today and uh, I will see you in the next live class. Bye bye.